Is she the bomb or what? I have been informed that the kids don't say that anymore, by the way, just so. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> so everybody comfortably seated in your new chairs? Ah, uh, nice, huh? So the thing about these chairs, we always measure chairs by time, like, you know, this is a 15-minute chair like we used to have hour chair. These are kind of two hour chairs so you may want to get a little cup of coffee before you come in because I figure I can just go on and on and on and on and <laughs> it'll be okay. So now that you're comfortably seated, please stand and turn to someone and say thank you for being a blessing in my life. So we've been exploring a wonderful book called The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success by Deepak Chopra. And um, we must be getting close to being successful, you would think, right? In this wonderful book, he looks at some principles, some laws. You see, one of the things that I come back to time and again in our teaching is that there are spiritual laws at work in our universe, just the way it is. Now, you can believe them or not, you can practice them or not. You can like it or not. You know, you can throw a fit if you want to, and it doesn't change the fact that the laws are the laws. So for me, the realization that this is a universe that is unfolding according to laws gave me a sense of power and possibility in my life. Because I then realized that I was not trying to overcome something. How many of you grew up with a God that you were trying to overcome his reluctance to your good? <laughs> right? Through your various means, your plotting, your scheming, your beseeching, all of the ways that we are trying to overcome something. But rather, we're approaching spirituality from an understanding that there is a divine intelligence, an infinite being. Deepak Chopra calls it the law of pure potentiality. That when we really understand that there is just an intelligence that is at the very core and the very essence of all that is, that is bursting into expression all of the time, then we realize that each and every second is a moment of pure potentiality. And that we, through the powers that we have been given, are able to co-create with that intelligence through our intention and through our desire. Now, it took us five weeks to get to intention and desire. I'm just shortening this whole thing for you here, right? Because what Deepak Chopra teaches us, what quantum physics is teaching us, and what the ancients have taught us, is that we live in this universal intelligence and that it is in this presence, as it says in the Christian Bible, that we live and move and have our being. When we begin to identify ourselves differently, we, we come to that awareness and that understanding that our life is the life of God. Now, before you get too carried away with that, um, you are not all that God is. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I have an ex that already has that position, but I'm just... <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> you <laughs> sort of... <laughs> you are not all that God is, but all that you are is God. Wow. Right? So we, it's a fundamental idea that says we are not separate from the divine, but rather the divine is everywhere. And if it is true for us, it is true for all. So everyone, everything, everything is a spark of the divine. And when we begin to move into that way of approaching reality, we have new insight and new awareness that comes from that way of living. So Deepak in this wonderful book is saying to us that if, if that is true, the way to get the process moving is through the law of giving. It is through the law of putting it out there. Now, some of us who read the Bible from an old way of being may have read the passage where it is said it is better to give than it is to receive. And we interpreted that incorrectly, I might add, to say that somehow it's wrong to receive. 
But what Jesus, I believe, was teaching us, what I think Deepak is teaching us, is that if we want to get the flow going in life, we would do well to go first. Whether it is through the giving of our gifts or whether it is through forgiveness, go first. Now, clearly, I know you're right. I get it. <laughs> I understand. You were right. You were wronged. And they're at blame. I get that. I understand it. And we could spend, we'll just stipulate that you get to be right. However, what I have discovered in my own life through trial and error is that if I am willing to forgive first, things start to move again for me. So, may make sense. I don't know. So Deepak Chopra says, if we want to begin working with this, these laws of spirituality, try the law of giving. Then he goes on to speak about the law of karma, the law of cause and effect. For me, this is one of the easiest ways to broach metaphysics with those, for, with those who may not be familiar with the teachings. Because everybody, everybody knows what goes around. Thank you. Right? Everybody knows that. We say it all the time. It is the law of karma. What we put out is what comes back to us. And so our teaching is based upon that very simple idea that who we are at a level of consciousness is reflected. There is a cause and there is an effect. And yet how often do we find ourselves trying to change the effects in our life? No one? Anyone? Nobody has ever done this? Oh, okay, just thought, right? We think that if we can just change the effects, then it'll all be okay. It is that approach to reality. I love the, the, the phrase that it's like moving the deck chairs around on the Titanic, right? <laughs> We're trying to rearrange reality, but the ship is going down, and the ship is going down because of how we are thinking about reality. So if we want to change, we would, might do well to begin looking at cause. And here's the rub. We are co-creative beings with the divine. That means we are co-causal. And if we are co-causal, if we would like to see a different effect, guess what? You're going you're gonna to figure this out, aren't you? Guess who has to change? Oh, you know, it's so frustrating. <laughs> so frustrating, you know? Oh. And yet, if we're willing to do that work, if we're willing to see life differently, if we're willing to practice, if we're willing to move into that place that Deepak Chopra speaks of, of moving into the gap, that place between what is seen and what is unseen and what is seen again, he calls the gap in the unseen. And when we move into that place with the power of our intention and our desire, we create an opening for reality to manifest itself anew. And so we spoke last week about the idea of intention and desire. Because we are co-creative, we are creating through the power of our intention. Now, we are co-creative all of the time. And we, we don't like that. I don't like that. I want to, you know, I personally, I would like to be co-creative from, oh, I'd say about 10 to 11. That's kind of when I'm <laughs> nicest. You know, that's kind of my high point. I'm not so great up until 10, after 10, 11, it's, you know, anybody's guess. So, you know, I really want the law to work right between 10 and 11 when I've done my spiritual practice and I'm seeing through the eyes of, of God, right? <laughs> but it turns out it's going on all the time. So we want to practice all of the time. And yet, if we can get that if through our intention, through our desire, that that which we seek is seeking its own self-expression through us, we can find new possibility and new creation. So having spoken about intention and desire, today I want to talk about the law of detachment. The law of letting go. And you're like, well, wait a minute. Last week you're saying, be clear, da 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 da, -da. What does this mean? And I'm going to suggest to you that it does not mean that we let go of our intention. What it does require of us, however, is that we be willing to let go of our attachment to how it must come about, to how life has to show up for us. All of the attachments that we have 
are based in past. They're based in the past. Because why, what do we know about the past? We know it. You know, right? You can look behind you and go, that's what happened. When you look into your future, it becomes a little murky because we're looking into the pure potentiality. And so it turns out that we as human beings tend to be more comfortable with what is known. Right? So we often refer back to what was, and we want to draw that forward and say, this is what will be. Because this happened before, now... I should expect this to happen again. But Dr. Holmes says something very powerful to us when he says that uh, principle, in other words, the divine creative intelligence, is not bound by precedent. Evolution is not bound by what has been, thank God. But rather, there is a leap forward of consciousness into new ways of expression, into new ways of being. And when we understand that, we realize that all of creation takes place at the edge of uncertainty, at the edge of the unknown. And so we have to decide, what are we going to believe in? Are we going to believe in the realm of form, in what is known, in what has been, or will we believe in the potential possibility of what could be? Right? So here's the thing. All the great spiritual traditions through the ages have taught some version of two parts of ourselves. There's two parts that live within us. There is, in the Eastern tradition, there is that part of us which is referred to as the self. The self with the capital S. The divine self, the higher self, the part that knows our relationship with God. In some traditions, we speak of the observer. You see, there's that part of us that actually witnesses our life taking place. When we can step back, moving out of the reactive mind, we can step back and we go, wow, here I am being joyful. Here I am being a jerk. Here I am being happy. Here I am being sad. Here I am being upset. Here I am, right? We're, there's a part of us that recognizes what's going on with us. That's the observer self. And the self, the divine self, knows its oneness with this, in, this life itself. It knows that. There's another part of us, <laughs> it turns out, sometimes referred to as the ego. And the ego believes itself as separate. It believes that it is somehow distanced from God. Many of us, as I said, grew up in traditions that believe that this divine power, this presence, God being whatever you want to call, was outside of us, was independent of us, and that we needed to overcome its reluctance to our good. But you see, that's a very ego way of being. Ego says, aha, it's all up to me. I must make it happen. Right? And so when problems and situations show up in our lives, we've got to solve those problems. But the law of detachment teaches us that there is a way of being when we identify and connect with the divine self that simply observes situations that come into our life and go away, and we are, we are working from a higher level of understanding. And when we can do that, we can detach from it, we can observe it, and we can create new possibilities. I know. You see, the ego is based in fear. The ego is based in lack. If you know, think about it, if you know your all-sufficiency resides because you are one with the divine, not a lot to sweat about, is there? I bring it on. But if there is a fear that, oh my God, what if there's not enough? And what if some of them already got some and there's not very much left now? Now what am I going to do, right? What if, you know, what if there's not enough love in the world 
And what if my husband or wife or spousal unit of any kind doesn't show me as much love as I need? Now what happens in my life? I have to live from sadness. Right? I mean, come on. That's what the ego does. It says it's all up to you. You must overcome life. But the self says, all that I have is thine. In me, you live and move and have your being. In the Tao Te Ching, it says it very beautifully. Listen to this. I think this is the 16th chapter. Look. It cannot be seen. It is beyond form. Listen. It cannot be heard. It is beyond sound. Grasp. It cannot be held. It is beyond imagination. These three are indefinable. Therefore, they are joined in one. From above, it is not bright. From below, it is not dark. An unbroken thread beyond description, it returns to nothingness. The form of the formless, the image of the imageless. It is called indefinable and beyond imagination. Stand before it, and there is no beginning. Follow it, and there is no end. Stay with the ancient Tao. Move with the present. Knowing the ancient beginning is the essence of the Tao. Now to our self, our spirit self, there's something that resonates with those words. There's something that doesn't understand it but doesn't need to understand it. To the ego, we're just kind of pissed off. <laughs> you know? Like, what the heck does that mean? I came here trying to get an answer to my problem, and you're going to talk about that it isn't, and it's formless, and it's going to be formed, and what, do you, what, what am I going to do, right? <laughs> right? And so here's the thing. The ego would say, well, that makes no sense, because I'm in charge of solving my problems. So I want to suggest to you today that there's another approach to reality. And that approach is learning to detach from what is and to see with new eyes, to see the way spirit sees things. And so in spirit, there really are no problems. The soul of evolution takes place as life learns to reform and recreate itself in new and powerful ways. So what was no longer works, and what is new and possible becomes, comes forward. If you think about it, life is, our lives, our individual lives, are nothing but a series of problems, right? I had to chuckle because I noticed before we moved into this building that kind of like for the last month, it seemed like every sentence in any of our meetings was, when we get into the new building, as if... We will arrive at the promised land and all things will flow with milk and honey and it will be wonderful and they will feed me grapes and I will be, uh, you know, <laughs> nirvana, right? <laughs> and then we got in we had to figure out how do the lights work and how do the sounds work and how do you turn on a microphone and all kinds of, um, <laughs> all kinds of new things, right? But isn't that what we do? We think, oh, as soon as I arrive at this destination, everything's going to be taken care of. As soon as I have a lot of money, boy, everything's going to be just fine. Soon as I get this new job, yes. As soon as I get rid of this spouse and get a new one, it'll be <laughs> great. Right? What's that great song, meet the, meet the new boss, same as the old boss? Right? Because we bring ourselves to our lives. So a way of approaching this might to be to even see this differently. You see, Deepak says something very powerful when he says, every problem, every problem you have in your life is the seed of opportunity for some greater benefit. Every seeming problem in our life carries with it the seed of possibility for some greater benefit. 
Think about this. Anytime an invention is made, somebody had a problem. I spoke recently about the Spanx lady. <laughs> and I wanted to do it again just because I like saying Spanx and I don't get that many, you know. <laughs> right? Here is genius because she had a panty line problem and said we must do something different and now is a billionaire. Right? So what if, what if your problem today is the seed of you becoming a millionaire? Would you look at it differently? Right? I know just this week I had a, my transmission tr stopped transmitting. I'm not sure how you say that. <laughs> it, <laughs> is that right? <laughs> Whatever they stop doing, you know. Um, <laughs> And it's a problem if you have a car to not have a transmission, it turns out, you know. <laughs> and my first thought of it was, thank God, because over the last month or so, you know, I've moved trailers, I've moved horses, I've moved all kinds of things. I was like, thank you for waiting to get me here safely and everybody taken care of before taking your rest. Um, and then my second thought was, oh my God, where am I going to come up with $3,000? Ah, right, right. I, I know this is a shock to you, but I do have that ego mind as well. <laughs> I, I, did I shock you? Do you need a moment with that? Okay. <laughs> and so I got to practice. You see, what if? Now, I, don't, I wish I had some like healing story. I put in the energy. I got to take it to a shop, and there's people that know how to fix these things, and all they want in exchange is some money, right? So then it's just some idea of how do I create that? Did I want to spend that money that way? No. Is it necessary? Yes. So what? Right? But you know, you can spend, and I, you know, can you believe this? I only put 170,000 miles on this car and all of a sudden it's going to break down on me? <laughs> How dare it? Right? <laughs> right? Doesn't your ego go there? How could this be happening to me? Well, you ran the hell out of the car. What do you think? You know? <laughs> I'm just saying. And so, if really the seeming problem in our life is simply an opportunity to reveal more of the divine, to bring forth some quality of spirit, if there's lack in our life, we're simply being given the opportunity to bring forth the pure potentiality of abundance. If there's not enough love in our life, we're simply being given the opportunity to bring forth greater love. Whatever is going in our life today, and I know some of you have real problems. I get it. And yet, if we can shift our way of thinking, if we can begin to approach it differently, if we can let go of how it should be and simply deal with what is, and then engage this tremendous power that we all have, we may find that within that seeming problem there is a gift and there's a new possibility. Just this week I was given two gifts. And they both came in the form of letters, emails. One, telling me why I'm the greatest minister that ever lived and how wonderful I am. Perceptive, I know. Um, <laughs> The second, telling me why I'm the worst minister that ever lived and how horrible I am. Now, the ego wants to take that and say, first of all, one is right, two is absolutely wrong, right? And justify and defend and do all of that sort of thing. But the self just says, hmm, look at these two gifts. Who are you? Neither of those, right? Neither of those. And so what I find is when people show up in our lives and they challenge us and they're calling us names and all of that sort of thing, they're simply giving us an opportunity to know who we are. And likewise, when people show up and tell us, oh, I love you and you're wonderful and you're blah, 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 they're just giving us an opportunity to know who we are. The trick is not to believe the first and disbelieve the second.
There's a wonderful exercise. You might try this sometime. On a piece of paper, you put on one side so the person can see it, tell me more. And on your side that you're looking, it says, this is not about me. And when you can do that, you can move out of the ego self and you can stand in, in truth and just say, tell me more. Even if people are seemingly attacking, you can go, tell me more. It's interesting. Wow. Because it's not about me. Wow. So I want to suggest to you today, I'm not being all airy-fairy and like, oh, life's all perfect. It's not. There are real problems happening in our world. Right? There's real stuff going on. I, so there's poverty, there's war, there's homelessness, there's all kinds of stuff. But I think what is required of us individually, collectively, is we have to be willing to approach life differently. We must be willing to look for the gifts that are being brought forward. We must be willing to know our oneness with the divine and call forth the qualities of spirit. You see, I keep saying that I do not believe that we will have peace on earth by going to war with each other. I, I don't know. I mean, you know, we only got about two or three or four, 10,000 years worth of experimenting with war, but it doesn't seem like that program's working. <laughs> I don't know, you know, maybe if we had a big war, you know, <laughs> we'll kill them into peace, right? Yeah. <laughs> Do you ever do this with people? You're going to beat them into submission, right? You're going to see why I am right. And nobody leaves the room until you get it, right? Or we just go, hmm, different perspective, you know? And so the world is calling for solutions. Our own lives are calling for new solutions. And what they're truly calling for is for us to be revealing more and more of the qualities of the divine, to bring forth more peace. This is why your spiritual practice is important. Your, yes, you. Look to your left, look to your right. Not talking to them, I'm talking to you. So, <laughs> this is why your spiritual practice is important, because until you are at peace, the world's not at peace. It's true with everything. So each of us have our own collective work to do our own individual work, and collective work. That's why we keep working as a community and deepening in consciousness and, and developing. And so then, if we can begin to approach our life not having problems, but rather opportunities. If you would just take that one thought today and say, this problem that I've been annoying my family about, boring my coworkers with, uh, you know, this one problem, what if I just saw this as the seed for my million dollars? How would I treat it differently? What new approach to it would I take? What becomes possible if I can detach and then set a new and powerful intention according to my heart's desire? And it is my belief that we can shift our lives just like that as we are willing to perceive reality differently. The law takes care of the rest. So just know your practice for the week, for those that choose to, practice letting go. Let's just take a breath on that one. <laughs> practice letting go. I know you're right. I know you're smarter than they are. I know you have a wonderful opinion. But just this one, just for one week, what if we didn't share it? <laughs> what if we just let them be who they are? I don't know. I'm just, you know, out on the edge here. Practice letting go. And then practice making welcome in your life what you want. You see, the ego believes that you have to make things happen. But spirit, the self, knows all we have to do is make that welcome. So we make peace welcome in our lives. We make love welcome in our lives. We make abundance welcome in our lives. We just create an atmosphere where that feels welcome. Come on in. Come on in, abundance. Have a cup of coffee. Let's hang out together for a while. 
I've hung out with your, <laughs> your other brother too long, right? <laughs> and so my invitation to you this week, know who you are. Recognize that you are a divine being created in the image and the likeness of the universe itself, given the tremendous possibility and potential to bring forth a greater reality and live from that place. Let us take a moment to pray together, shall we? We simply turning inward, taking a deep breath, Recognizing that with every breath we breathe, we are participating in the divine flow of the universe. There is an intelligence even behind the breath that breathes us. And so we connect with that now. We're simply honoring and acknowledging the one life everywhere present, always available. That which delights in its self-expression that which creates by becoming that which it has created. And so this same divine intelligence which causes all things to be, all things to grow, all things to become, is our very life and being right here and right now. And so we breathe into that. We accept that truth. We choose to make welcome in our lives that which we desire. We rec welcome the presence of wholeness, allowing that wholeness to reveal itself as health, as well-being, as vitality. We make welcome the presence of absolute unconditional love. And we know that our lives are healed and transformed, blessed through the power of this love. We choose to joyously and lovingly forgive ourselves and to forgive those who we perceive to have harmed us. We choose love over every other option and we are blessed. We choose to make welcome the presence of abundance that we live and grow in that dynamic and loving state of giving and receiving of the divine bounty. In truth, nothing is ours. It simply passes through our lives. So we enjoy it, we love it, we bless it as it moves on. How good it is to stand witness to the ever-present reality of divine spirit. And we open our hearts this day and our minds to live more powerfully from the ultimate power of pure spirit. Today, what we see as, an, as a problem, we choose to see as a possibility, as an opportunity. And so we say, thank you, God, for the many blessings in my life, including this. We live from that state of blessed being. And so we give thanks and we extend blessing to others. We bless this spiritual community knowing that it is divinely guided into perfect right action. That we might be a bright light in a world that sometimes appears dark. We bless our brothers and sisters around the planet this day. We hold the high vision for a planet at peace. For a world that works for everyone. As always, we bless all all teachers of all faiths. For we recognize and know there are many pathways to the divine. And wherever spirit is experienced and expressed, we name it as good. We allow the healing of the ages to take place in this instant, moving forward with divine possibility. And so I give thanks this day. I give thanks for the many blessings making themselves known. I give thanks for the healing that has occurred in this holy instant. And so I know there's nothing more to do but to simply release this word into that divine law. To know it takes care of the rest and we can let go. We can let God. 
Oh, Sam, in joy and gratitude, we simply allow it to be so, as together we say, and so it is. <laughs>